But Robin hasn't seen this slide yet because I've been saving it for. This is Champagne Beach this year. Oh. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Can't go back. Can't go back. Yeah. All right. So this one's for Barb. This this is from the chapter entitled Big Money. I told Barb I was going to come into it someday, and that's how I had to have it. <laughs> so uh, we went to Yap, which is in the middle of Micronesia in the Carolines. Am I doing? Am I good? Am I good? Run out of time. All right. Um, and we didn't know it, but uh, the big the big tsunami. You know, they killed a quarter million people, uh, sort of uh, did that. And we had no contact on YAP because they just had a uh, cyclone the year before that wiped everything out. Telecommunication, you know, which is why we went, because we always do that. <laughs> so this is about um, a message from my father to call him and the conversation that ensued. But there was another natural catastrophe that had occurred just as we were flying into YAP which was about to affect our day. It was waiting in the form of a telex from my sister-in-law back at the lodge. Call your father. My heart jumped into my throat. What could it mean? And where could I make an international long distance call on one of the most remote islands in the Southern Sea after the worst typhoon in 50 years? We'll have to go to the telecom dish, said T-shirt. Where's that? I asked. At the top of the hill. He said, pointing to the sky. Of course, I thought, that's where it would be. It was 32 degrees. The sun was overhead. We started across the causeway and up the hill. The views of the inlets and bays in the way were beautiful, with wide expanses of silver shimmering off the ocean below. But I was drenched by the time we made the connection to the connection. The official inside the telecommunications office was wonderfully accommodating and handed me the receiver even before I'd finished thanking him for his <laughs> efforts. It rang the ring of northwestern Ontario, on the other end of the line, half a world away. Hello? My father answered. This better be good, I said. I'm paying big money for this call. He paused for a brief moment until the voice recognition software kicked in. Stay out of the water, he shouted. <laughs> what? I said, not getting this at all. Stay out of the water, he repeated, even more desperate. Why? I asked, confused. People are dying all over Asia, he shouted. What? I asked. People are dying all over Asia, he said again. We're not in Asia, I said. Then there came a long pause. Oh, he said. <laughs> it became apparent to me that, while well, my father has always kept up well with news and current events, and knew of the Boxing Day Indian Ocean earthquake and tsunami, which had killed almost a quarter of a million people in over 14 countries, his knowledge of geography was still a bit on the challenge side. <laughs> you said you were going to Indonesia, he said. I said we were going to Micronesia, I said. Where the hell's that, he asked. <laughs> <laughs> I told him it was time for a map, nap, and I loved him very much. When I hung up, Robin asked me what was wrong. He got his natural disasters mixed up, I, mixed up, I said, and we started back down the hill. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so. In the Carolines, the least visited island is an island called Koshrae. And it, it bothered me a lot. I wanted to go. It wasn't on the, the direct route because it was called the Mysterious Paradise Island. And I like paradise and I like mysteries, so I thought I'd find the, the reason why it was mysterious. <clears throat> we walked towards Lelu, past frangipanis and breadfruit and papaya pigs in pens and starving mutts in numbers too lethargic to bark to the tofu shop with the last bottle of rum. Robin posed in front of a larger than life-sized inflatable Santa. Black clouds gathered together above us as we paid for our indulgence. The second mystery was why there wasn't more in stock. With what was coming they should have made sure that they would never run out. We just managed to thumb a ride in the back of a covered truck before the sky cracked open and it hosed down all night. The showers let up for just enough time on Sunday morning to allow Robin and I to attend the Koshrai Pentecostal Church service. We were greeted by a mountain of flip-flops and shoes outside, to which we added our own, huge brown moo, moo women inside, and the Pentecostal pastor on the dais who made sure he got our names right so he could welcome us at embarrassing length. 
He didn't leave out a detail of our lives that we hadn't told him about, and some that he just sleuthed out by himself. The Lord helps those. He told us how Jesus saves, baptizes, heals, and is coming again. And then he went rogue. At first it sounded like he was speaking Kosh Ryan, but I knew it wasn't Kosh Ryan, and so did everyone else. And they began speaking in the same language that he was speaking in, except that it wasn't a recognizable language at all. An immense hall full of brown people began swaying and shouting unintelligible gibberish, trying to connect with the gift of the Holy Spirit, little knowing that Robin and I had purchased the last bottle on the island the previous afternoon. <laughs> the consciousness of Bruce and Katrina, the San Francisco hippie eco-preservationists thought they were bringing to Koshra, had mi missed the actual ecology on the island by several generations in a tropical country mile. They deluded themselves into believing that the least mangrove swamp was a simple, blank California creator canvas waiting to be painted into a paragon of living in harmony with nature and the envy of the real civilized world. They would provide their guests with a festival of flora and fauna and mud, like Woodstock. People expected mud at festivals and would have asked them for their money back if they didn't get it. But no one had asked for the the heavy, sticky, oppressive, sweltering, equatorial reality of Koshrai, if it wanted to fall in love with their ideology. Bruce and Katrina, with the best of temperate intentions, had built a resort in a mosquito-infested bog, mudlicious and puddle-wonderful. The biodegradable cottages had begun degrading from the moment of their birth. Humidity and salt had proved too much. The wall of the next shack was as shabby and filthy and dowdy and dirty and stained with green slime and bat droppings. If the Californians had taken the time and consideration to ask the original Koshrines whether they would have preferred living in their natural materials or something more durable, durable would have beaten natural to death. Bruce and Katrina ended up in a survival dance with the mysterious entropic forces they had romanticized. The environmentalism they had nurtured as their salvation had so outgunned them in the wild competition for protein and reproductive resources that they ended up shell-shocked and paralyzed. Nature pours a vacuum, and she filled their space with sludge. It actually rained inside the hut, or at least thick humidity inside our dark space. The gray water effluent drains that Bruce had proudly installed instead of plumbing were an ideal breeding ground for mosquitoes. Even in the torrential downpour, plagues of them bit through our ponchos inside the traditional thatch in the traditional way that they had always bitten. Robin and I lit a half a dozen mosquito coils but the traditional breeziness through the traditional hatch, hatch, thatch wafted away the healing smoke. The screens designed to keep them out were torn. We asked for bug spray. The can was rusted shut. <laughs> I prayed for more geckos. Under and using the barely functional to toilet at night required crawling out from under a musty net into a wall of biomass. It wasn't just mosquitoes, although they had been waiting patiently. Rats and crabs and ants and gigantic spiders made their own debut, ascending from, ascending from the mud below the drains. Cobwebs that had been washed away by the shower's dripping rose would mysteriously reappear by morning. Nature had filled the abhorrent holes in the towels and bedding and netting with stains. There was rat shit on the table and fleas and the feral cats in the dining room. By the fourth day, there was mold and my multivitamins. <laughs> it was a festival. Thankfully, we had rum. Mud not the fountain that gave drink to the. <coughs> One night, we braved the Thatch restaurant. Purchase of liquor, liquor in this restaurant requires a valid drinking permit and purchase of a meal as per Koshrai state law. Under the dim lights and sprinklings of termite dust, Robin and I poured over the a la carte menu. Mud was one of the four food groups. <laughs> Pawak, a whole mangrove crab, steamed. I love crab. I love the pheromone sensuous white flakes of our Barkley Sound Dungeness crabs, the claws and legs and every morsel from the carapace back in British Columbia. I love coconut crab, right off the trees and rocks of the Southern Sea. Love crab. We have the largest mangrove trees in the Pacific, said the waitress. I had read the Kashrayan legend of their creation. I love the mud crab, I said, and then I noticed the menu item below it. Pawak Parmesan, with fresh Parmesan. I asked Robin. Why would you put Parmesan on crab, she shrugged. It was a mystery. She ordered the Wahoo Fiesta. When the crab came out, he looked angry. Maybe it was because of his big vermilion spiky carapace or his broken claws and legs, but he wasn't happy. 
I took in a big chunk of meat. Apparently, I frowned. Well, asked Robin, tastes like mud. <laughs> Maybe that's why they put the parmesan on her, she said. <laughs> Mystery solved. <laughs> How's the fiesta? Wahoo, she said. For dessert, we have home. Oh, I don't think I'll do that one. That, that one's the best one, so you can buy it. <laughs> Here's, so let's go to Tahiti. Tahiti has changed, I have to tell you right off the bat. Right? We're good. The last white orchid dropped onto my office carpet. I was ready. Robin had been all over the southern sea with me, but never here. There had been many reasons. Tahiti was, above all else, expensive. I don't mean costly. I mean first-born limb amputation, extortion expensive. Second, it was French. Robin is a true blue kiwi ever since the sinking of the Rainbow Warrior in Auckland Harbor and her near starvation for calories and cordial communication on a Parisian tour had considered all Gallic references off limits. Third, Tahiti was a bit off the direct flight route from Vancouver Island and required a diversion through Los Angeles, which, since the World Trade Center tragedy, had become apocalyptically paranoid. But it was my intention to show her the other side, and during the global financial meltdown of 2008, Tahiti reappeared over our horizon with a random click on a website I would have never otherwise thought to visit. <clears throat> I typed it in the search engine of Luxury Link. What appeared was astounding, and I began to tick off the boxes in my head. Bora Bora. Check. Right time. 